I think there are uh, three big forces that are at work that have not existed in our lifetimes before, and they are um, a long-term debt cycle, and we've reached the part of that cycle where interest rates are at zero and monetary policy is a major driver. What this looks like in a world where we're going to print a lot of money, monetize debt, and so on. There are three stages really in monetary policy. And the cycle that we are in, the whole world cycle, began in 1945. But that was the um, beginning of the new world order. 1944, we established the dollar as the world's reserve currency. It was connected to gold. And then until 1971, that broke up. And so there was an arc in which central banks have the capacity to produce demand by producing credit. Just sort of hit a button and poof, and demand rises because credit comes out. But when interest rates no longer are effective and hit zero, as they did in 2008, you have you go to a monetary policy, which I call monetary policy two, which is the printing of money and the buying of financial assets. And with that, there was the implications of that. Lots of liquidity in the world, bidding up the asset prices. And we had an environment which was very good for capitalism, corporate tax cuts. All of that caused asset prices to rise. Then, of course, it also contributes to the wealth gap. So this first influence, monetary policy, is an overarching influence. It's important to understand where we are in that cycle. Related to that cycle is also the wealth gap cycle, periods of prosperity that occur after wars, during periods of peace. There are periods of peace because there's a dominant power that no one wants to fight and you have a prosperous period. And during those periods, there's a lot of development of credit, a lot of also expansion of prosperity and so on, technology development, and that creates wealth gaps. So our wealth gap is now the largest since the 1930s, and the political gap is also very large. And so that influence is a giant influence. So that's number two. And then number three as the major influence is the rise of a great power to challenge the existing world leadership of the United States. And these cycles have happened over periods of time. That competition, that wars of various types, trade wars and the like, is another factor. So those factors are in place and were in place before we had the coronavirus. The coronavirus came along and it has big financial implications. I think those are the three factors. And now when we look at monetary policy, I'd like to get into what that means, what the value of money is, and how that affects markets and the currencies that we're uh, dealing with. In the normal world, at normal times, the way the system works is central banks put money on deposit and banks come along and they borrow that money and lend it to those who they expect will pay back. And that then passes through the credit system and then all financial assets compete with each other. It spreads out, credit gets expanded, and then there's the issue of payback, and then we have the cycles. Money's too loose, inflation rises, central banks tighten money, and it slows down and we go through our cycles. That's no longer the case for the most part. Today, the economy and the markets are driven by the central banks and the coordination with uh, the central government. What I mean by that is the purchases right now of financial assets by the Federal Reserve or the purchases by the Federal Reserve of government securities are the drivers of that market. So the production of the money, if you look at money and you look at who is in the market. So the Federal Reserve, for example, will set an interest rate for different types of creditors based on its economic objective. In the old days, let's say when we had the 2008 financial crisis, we needed to protect banks because they were systemically important and then money market funds and, and commercial paper and the like. Now it's much broader than that. 
the whole economy is systemically important. If they didn't go out and make lending to companies, we would lose large parts of our economy. And so we're in a situation now where they're the market makers. Take the market out, take the central banks out, and you have a different story, including the value of money. What is the value of money? I mean, think about it in Europe, for example. The central bank will lend to banks at a minus 1%. So that means you don't have interest payments. In fact, you have interest credits. And the central banks will take that debt on. They'll loan it. And they have a political agenda, not a economic agenda, in which they'll determine whether they'll be paid back or when they want to be paid back based on how the economy is doing and what will happen. So in that case, like an example in Europe and the similar situations in the United States and Japan in varying degrees, they will make loans that will have interest credits almost or let's say zero, you don't have to pay interest back, and you may not have to pay principal back. It depends on what the conditions are at the time. So those are markets which are driven by central banks, not only their actions, but their desire to be an owner of those assets and their priorities about that ownership when they buy and when they sell are not the same as the classic free market allocations. And as a result, the capital markets are not free markets allocating resources in the traditional ways. Central banks are willing to go and need, and need to go as far as it takes in order to keep the system afloat. And because we're in the late, late stages where we have a lot of debt, you are going to see central banks' balance sheets explode. They, they have to because the choice is the sinking ship. I've studied the rises and decline of reserve currencies because I, I think we're at an, a key moment. And I studied the rise and decline of the Dutch Gilder, the rise and decline of the British pound, the rise and decline of currencies throughout history. When the time comes where you're faced with political disruptions, is there enough money? There will be enough money. The question will be what the value of the money is and how far they can go.